Hello, everybody. This is the session with Moscow Center of Excellence. And here's Igor Karganov and Luke Jones and Alexander Zak and Alex Dadinsky. Uh, we are not all in Russia, but we are all close to Russia. Some of us are Russians. So uh, let me begin with the topic, and we call it doing business with modern Russia. So, uh, in, well, despite the fact that there are some challenges in the world, and as Dean Kagram said, uh, complex and difficult times that we're facing right now. Oh, yeah, I see Sanjeev. Hello, George, I started telling you, Igor. This is where we <laughs> going, my friend. We just joining you from Singapore and Jakarta. We had a wonderful, and we had uh, alums from Vietnam and the Philippines, and Korea it was wonderful. So, but we're now in Russia and the CIS. Yeah. So over to you, yeah. Igor. <laughs> Hi, nice to see you. And I was I was really enjoying your message uh, at two a.m. I guess. From we Phoenix. don't sleep, Igor. We're T-birds. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, uh, are you willing to start by some nice words that you always say in the beginning? Okay, I'm happy to do so. First of all, uh, you know, we're just so proud and confident of everything that we're doing at the school, but all of our alums, all of you around the world, and particularly you see that beautiful image of CBSD in, 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 in Moscow, CBSD Thunderbird. You know, it's a gem of, of Thunderbird that for far too long we didn't embrace uh, at headquarters and really understand the incredible work that Anna and Igor and the incredible team um, uh, is doing. You know, uh, 25 years, right, Igor? Uh, we celebrated. I was there for that incredible celebration. Oh, it's 27 uh, already. I know it feels like yesterday I was there <laughs> and uh, you know, 500,000, just, just think about the scale of that 500,000 business professionals trained across the CIS over 25 years. And Igor, right? Our ambition is to do 5 million over the next 10 years, right? There's no reason yeah. why not, right? With all the digital tools, all the capacities, all the capabilities. So, you know, Moscow is a real CBSD Moscow, uh, Russia, uh, Thunderbird Russia is an inspiration for the whole worldwide network. Uh, and despite the challenges of the pandemic, obviously um, the role of Russia in the world and all of the challenges and, and complexities of that, we know that if we are true, to, true to, truly going to be Thunderbird, we have to be everywhere. Uh, and Russia and the CIS is absolutely central. So I want to pass it over to you, Igor, to share a little more. You uh, are, is Anna with us? Is she no, here? unfortunately, she's on the oh, plane. She can join us. Okay, no problem. So we want to just thank. I want to say, you know, though she's not here, as Igor would, I'm sure, con concur. You know, Anna really has taken CBSD. You know, from a little baby that was flowering, you know, growing and a flower that was blooming into this incredible institution. And you know, weathered tough times and been able to keep this uh, the ship steady and grow it and transform it, and then with great um, you know team members and leaders like Igor, really take it to the next level. So Igor, let's start a little bit with uh, CBSD and what's going on with CBSD, and then let's get to the to wonderful T Bird alum panelists to share a little about their perspective on Russia, Russia and the world, what's going on. Igor, yeah, thank you, Dean Kongaram. Uh, let me continue starting introducing the, the section. And I started uh, with the words doing business with more than Russia. So uh, despite the fact that there are difficult times, we believe that there are a lot of possibilities and the opportunities are huge and with Russia as well. Um, and this VUCA world, which was mentioned during the uh, Tokyo Seoul uh, session, uh, is here. So uh, let's look at that as an opportunity, not as a threat. So uh, let me continue with a short introduction of myself. Uh, I'm a business trainer and a head of strategy at uh, CBSD Thunderbird. I've been working for the company for more than eight years. And before that, I was doing some consulting and HR uh, in different areas. Uh, and to start with the CBSD uh, introduction, I suggest we watch a short video of our experience. The 
the 90s were a difficult time for all in Russia. The country was reinventing itself. People and companies felt the need to change, but no one knew exactly how or what to do. Everyone wondering about the role they are to play in the new reality require new kind of people with new skills. People enlightened, ready for a breakthrough. While some were looking for profit, we were looking for knowledge. Everyone who stood at the cradle of talent development in Russia searched the world for best practices. shared them to help new leaders change history. United, we changed ourselves and changed the world around us. All of us, together. That was how the TND market was conceived. We are proud to have also stood at its source. 25 years of the TND market in Russia. 25 years of CBSD. Yeah, it's now become 27 years already. So we're, we've been here for a long time and Thunderbird has a strong presence in Russia. And we were, uh, yes, well, actually we are proud to be part of the Thunderbird family and we are proud to, you know, get those connections even stronger uh, from year to year. So uh, just a short, info about the Thunderbird in Russia. We are there for 27 years. Uh, we have more than 20 international uh, partners. We have five, 500, I, I was going to say 500, 50 plus trainers and methodologies developing all kinds of all sorts of training and learning solutions. We are quite recognized on the local market uh, we're, we were SME of the year by AmCham twice. Uh, we have some um, a training expo, which, which is the local uh, exhibition of training and development firms uh, special awards. And we are one of the top three. Well, actually, we were called a leading training firm uh, in Russia last year. And we have, as Dean Kagram said uh, already, trained more than half a million people so we're looking forward to get this number with a zero at the end five million people or maybe even more so let me introduce you uh to what we do we actually do all sorts of training and development activities through all sorts of media and uh formats uh, uh we cover every aspect of management and leadership development. And we are trying to get the best from, our, from the opportunities given by Thunderbird and greater ASU. So I will not like bore you with the words. Uh, let's move on. So Russian market is something special. So uh, we cannot just teach in English and we cannot just uh, put everyone's in Zoom as everyone in the world can, uh, because a lot of the security reasons and government restrictions and uh, localization need, needs are here in Russia. So uh, there are some difficulties and it's also making uh, the work we do more interesting and challenging and fascinating. So, uh, and, and also uh, it's, it's one of the things that our panelists will talk about. Uh, Russian audience, Russian professionals are something, something in a good meaning, I mean. Uh, HR and L&D professionals are really well knowledgeable and they are always a good audience to get uh, a knowledgeable conversation with, not to cheat, to teach. Uh, so this is something we are uh, getting, you know, excitement up about. 
So let me introduce our three panelists today, and we'll start with Luke Jones, who's the author of a bestseller in Russia uh, called Why Russians Don't Smile. Yes, this is the book he's holding in his hands. Hello, Joe, Luke. Luke is uh, an HR uh, and a director of HR services at TerraLink Global and also a co-chair in American Chamber of Commerce in Russia uh, in HR uh, committee, I guess, right, Luke? Yes. Uh, Alexander Zak, Professor Alexander Zak is a uh, scholar and a lecturer in different institutions. And one of the uh, institutions uh, you see on the slide, uh, MIT Sloan Institution. Alex Dalinsky is also a scholar and a founder of educational marketplace called Corsalytics. Uh, well, last two persons are Russians originally living abroad. Uh, and Alexander will, well, I, I, I guess he will say some words about his originality, but he's a Russian origin American citizen living in Spain. So he's a true Thunderbird, even though he was not a part of the Thunderbird educational system so far. Well, yeah, you, you, were, you are a Thunderbird network part, right? Alexander, yeah. So let me first give a floor to Luke Jones with, and, and, and what I suggest you all, uh, and, and with the Q&A afterwards, try and answer the question which was in the topic of this session. So why do business with Russia? Uh, and how to succeed with modern Russia, with all those difficulties and challenges and VUCA reality surrounding it. So, Luke, the floor is yours. We have to. The mic is muted. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Yeah, I'll kick off with five minutes or so uh, just of my experiences here. Um, I'm a Brit with some Canadian heritage. The reason I'm Luke, mum's from Quebec, although I grew up in England, came out to Russia in the early 90s, and I've been here pretty much ever since. And what I really wanted to do was just share some of what I call the myths and stereotypes about Russia. And this is why I wrote the book. And I called it Why Russians Don't Smile, because that's the main stereotype that foreigners have about Russia, even if they've never been here. And in terms of business, I mean, Russia doesn't do positive PR. Let's start with that, okay? I think the Kremlin's biggest fear is appearing weak. And they think that if we're sort of like nice, sort of smiley, feely, touchy, then we're just going to come across as weak. We've got to give this big you know, tough mat, tough guy image, or else nobody will respect us, okay? So from that respect, uh, that gives a lot of uh, uh, ammunition to foreign journalists who would much rather write about the Russian mafia or, um, you know, about, uh, you know, Novichok or Navalny or Putin or the Crimea, and they never focus on anything else. So from a business perspective, I mean, I found some of the best things about doing business in Russia are the fact that there is very, very low competition here. Because the whole world is so scared about coming here, uh, it means there's a lot more opportunity for the people who are here. And although there's kind of a tough exterior, once you get here, it isn't really that difficult. So the advice I give to people who have never been here and are considering coming is, Whatever you have read in the international media or you watch on TV, ignore it or believe the opposite because it simply isn't relevant to you coming here and doing business. I think the biggest and most popular misconception is that because Russians look like we do, therefore they should act like us. So if you do business with Chinese, Indians, Africans, Latin America, people look different. So, hey, it's natural 
that they behave differently. Yet Russians look European, so why don't they behave like Europeans? What I've found, some of the key differences are that in Western society, we do everything with much more of a structured, logical, pragmatic thought behind it. And the mistake I made is I spent the first 10, 15 years in Russia trying to find some logic to what anyone ever did or said. And often there wasn't any. And this strikes us as being very irrational. But it's not right or wrong. That is just how things are done here. Russians themselves will tell you, you know, forward planning is pointless because you don't know what's going to happen in a few weeks time, let alone a few decades. You know, one Russian girl I know moved to Germany a few years ago. And I said, you know, how do you like it there? And she said, well, you know, it's comfortable. But, you know, Germans are obsessed with pensions and insurance. And she said, look, I'm 28. I don't even want to think about a pension. You know, uh, it's far too far ahead. And insurance is one of these things that Russians are quite fatalistic. It's like, well, why would I want to waste money on insurance? You know, if, if I paid the premiums and my car didn't get stolen or crashed, well, I've wasted my money. Uh, and if it was crashed, well, you know, that's fate. It was meant to be. So the point is that it's not about um, who's right or wrong. It's, just, it's a different way of doing things over here. There are slightly different rules to the game. But the most common expression I hear from people who come to Russia for the first time is, oh, wow, it's normal. I didn't think it was going to be like that. Uh, and I said, well, what did you expect? And they say, look, the only thing we hear on TV about Russia is Putin, 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 Navalny, Novichok, Skripal, Putin, Donetsk, Crimea, and Putin again. And that is all you ever hear. Now, I've never met Putin, never even seen him. You know, he's not relevant to what we do in a business society. So the advice I give is put all that to one side, come on over, come and talk to people who are successfully doing business here, because... In the AmCham, some of the biggest U.S. companies will tell you that Russia is in their top 10 performing markets. But the conversation I had with Igor a couple of days ago is that nobody is shouting about this because it's very politically incorrect to be standing on the rooftop saying, look, look at all the profit we're making in Russia. So the business is being done, but it's under the radar. So you think there's a lot of double standards. People say, oh, there's a dictatorship in Russia. But these people will quite happily do business with Saudi or China. But I think, oh, Russians look like we do. So because they don't behave the same, hey, that's what is wrong. So anyway, that's my uh, uh, addition. Um, open for any questions. I will put the link to the book in the chat. I also created a YouTube channel with some videos about Russia that I made about different cities here. So please go and have a look at that and open to any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Luke. That was an amazing introduction to the cultural aspects of Russia. So uh, going back to the economic aspect, why Russia is so popular uh, in business and unpopular in uh, like talkings? Well, why it's unpopular in talkings because of the political correctness is clear. But why is it so uh good to be to do business with what do you think look is it was that to me that question yeah <laughs> so yes, well, yes. Well, i think um, like i said uh i think igor the um what it comes down to is the fact that you know bad news sells more newspaper fills more airtime than good news i mean my mother's home country canada you know, we say it's the kind of place where everything works and nothing happens. Why is Canada never in the news? Because everything's okay there. And, you know, I think a lot of the time is the fact that a lot of people do still have this Cold War mentality. Uh, and one of the favorite quotes I heard was uh, back in the late 1980s when Mikhail Gorbachev came to power and a Wall Street journalist uh, asked him, so Mr. Gorbachev, are you planning to implement, you know, Western style economic democratic reforms into Russia. And he said, look, it took you guys in the US 200 years to get to where you are today. Why do you think that we can do it in 200 days? And, you know, I'm not by any means saying that things are going in the right direction in Russia. Honestly, they're not. 
Okay, uh, I'll be the first one to admit that. And I think it's going to take at least another 10 years before anything changes. Because if you look at it, back in the 90s, when Yeltsin got re-elected in 96, he had this uh, slogan, Dume Vuderai, you know, basically choose and vote, or, you know, in, in the sense that what they could compare with was the fact that stores, shops were empty in the 80s, they were full in the 90s, even if people didn't have much money. It was chaotic, but people thought it's got to, you know, at least you can go and buy things, you can travel abroad. Okay, you need money, but, you know, the choice is there. Okay, now we're in a situation where everybody is frightened about going back to the chaos of the 1990s, and the people in power remember this. So until you get at least a decade further, and the people who eventually uh, get into government don't remember the chaos of the 90s, it's not going to change. Okay, but from a purely business point of view, uh, you know, that isn't really that relevant. So uh, the question is, why do you think Russia is so attractive from the business perspective? Because you're starting with an open playing field. I mean, you know, like that <laughs> you go to even you know, any capitalist country, business has been happening there for hundreds of years. Uh, whereas in Russia, literally, um, you know, by, buying this book and selling it at a profit 30 years ago, you would have gone to jail for that. Okay, so uh, there just wasn't the competition. And I've also found that Russians as candidates, you know, having worked in the HR industry for more than 20 years, there's a lot of brain power here. There's some really bright people. Um, you know, when it comes to anything from literature, history, technology, there are some very bright people. There's, there's no shortage of brain power. Where is lacking is what I would call the commercial aspect, that a lot of people are not able to translate that into making money um, and you know as a result that if you are uh, let's say if you've got a commercial brain and you realize like whatever it is I do how do I monetize this you can do very well so from that point of view uh, yeah you've got low competition it's a completely open field you can go somewhere you can set up something new Russians will tell me oh there's loads of competition and I say okay go to London come back and we'll continue the conversation yeah. yeah. Thank you, Luke. That's that's a great point to go to another speaker, uh, Alexander Zak. Uh, and I think it's it's a great opportunity to talk about the difference between the business opportunities and the brain opportunities. So I guess, yeah, uh, this is something to start with. Alexander. Thank you, Igor. Um, I would like to build on Luke's comment about the brain power and the, the talent which is there. I remember um, probably 15 years ago now, I was working with a, a large multinational bank that was moving much of its IT-related operations to Hong Kong. It was a multi-billion dollar a year operation, so success mattered. And um, the head of the organization was a, a Western guy who came to Hong Kong and found after a short while that people were waiting for him to give orders. <laughs> and he tried to encourage people to speak up, encourage people to innovate, to propose, and finally, his direct reports um, told him that they got it. They got it, they asked him to have a meeting with them, they had that meeting, and the meeting that they opened with, uh, their opening was, we understand, we understand how critical it is, we understand how we need to move fast, so just tell us, what do you want us to do? <laughs> <clears throat> and it's true, and again, I, I realize that these are generalization and somewhat generalizations and somewhat stereotypical. My intent is not to say you always get high quality operational results in Hong Kong, but you tend to believe that an experience shows that if you're lucky in Hong Kong, you will get exactly what you asked for. In Russia, I think it's going to be unlikely that you'll get exactly what you asked for, but there are other benefits. 
So I would not move the operations necessarily to Russia. I wouldn't say not to move it, but it would not be my first choice. But I do want to talk a little bit about what aspects of the brain that maybe Luke referred to in particular is helpful now when we are facing VUCA, the rate of change is quite fast. What is required and what does Russia have that maybe some of the other markets do not quite have at the same level? Now, something to keep in mind, and I, I'm quite sensitive to the idea that uh, Russians may not smile, they, they don't. And I remember the comment the donkey made in Shrek when they were talking about donkeys being like onions. They have layers. The outer layer for the Russians is quite calloused, and you do need to peel it to see what the other layers are. And not everybody in Russia is like an onion. They may be another vegetable. What we need for management and leadership are onions, and I will talk about onions. There are plenty of carrots and potatoes, and I don't know what to do with them. But in management cadre, there are lots of onions, and I would like to focus on a couple of useful layers and explain or touch on why they're useful. One of the layers is mindset. It is helpful when the mindset is aligned with what the environment is presenting and the future opportunities you're trying to explore. The ideal mindset for that is what I would call architect of stakeholder well-being. You want the person you're working with not to wait for you to issue an order and run and fulfill it, which plenty of people in Russia would want to do. You want them to recognize that stakeholder does not, in fact, cannot know what they want. They can have an idea, they may have an idea of what they may not want, but to precisely know what they want is an erroneous expectation. The flip side of it is when you go to an expert and they say, look, I am the expert, you're just the stakeholder, you're my customer or client, I know what's good for you, you don't, that also leads to an unproductive, rather short conversation. What I mean by an architect of stakeholder well-being, it's a collaborative architectural creative effort to try to imagine and construct the future of well-being, not just immediate comfort. And in Russia, in part because culture is very direct, people are very comfortable telling you what they think, it is readily observable. I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, some years ago, probably 20 years ago now, uh, my wife and I were in San Francisco um, shopping for some clothing in a high-end store, and a salesperson was Russian. And my wife was trying on several outfits, and she is in very good shape, good looking, some of the outfits fit well, and I brought some outfit that I wanted her to try as well. She put it on, and the salesperson looked at her and said, this outfit makes you look like a sausage. Now, imagine in any Western store having a Western uh, attendant tell you that you look like a sausage. It would be unheard of. It would be insulting. But you begin to realize that the intent of that saleswoman was not to insult the customer, but for the customer's well-being, why waste the money on something that later you would either be disappointed on or you would realize that you were outright cheated? You find that in Russia in spades. Again, it's a layer underneath the callous surface. But you may walk into a coffee shop, and my favorite one in St. Petersburg is called More Coffee. Excellent place. First time I walked in there, I saw that they had several coffee makers of different types with different types of coffee in them. And I wanted to try them out. So I said, please give me this one. And then a few minutes later, bring me that one. And afterwards, I would like to have a try of this, this other one. And this young woman who may have been 18, 19 years old, looked at me and said, I don't think that's what you want. Oh, well, what do you think I want? Well, if you try that one first, it's going to claw your palate and then 
things are not going to go as well as, as, as they should. And I, I realized that she actually does have expertise in coffee and she can construct a better morning for me than I could construct myself. So I said, well, please do bring the coffee in the order you think is going to be best. For an 18 or 19 year old, not the owner, to take the ownership of the relationship with a customer and creating the outcome that the customer is going to be grateful for is a skill which is hard to come by and foundationally it can expand to all of your sales, all of your uh, requirements, generation and management, where you begin to realize that your relationship with the lead customers can be completely transformed if the representatives that you have understand that even the lead customers need to have collaborative engagement. So that part of the mindset is part of the Russian DNA. It's also important to look at the skill stack. By skill stack, I mean what capabilities do people bring? So Luke mentioned that you have uh, a lot of intelligent people. It's more than intelligent. Actually, across the world, um, the, the average intelligence is, is rather similar. There are some places where it's slightly higher, some places slightly lower, but a Russian IQ level is about the same as, let's say, US or Great Britain. Um, But what skills do they bring? In cybernetics, there's a theorem called Ross Ashby's theorem of requisite variety, which says that when you're looking at controlling a complex system, the control mechanism, the control system, has to have at least as many states as the possible number of states of the system. So what does that mean? It means that if you are looking at repairing some complex system, your toolbox should have at least as many tools as the possible types of breakages that they can be. So if there could be breakages for which you do not have the tools, you can't claim that you can control the system. So this is theory, theorem of requisite variety. What's required for that? Well, first of all, it's helpful when you are explaining this to people, they have studied cybernetics and they understand what the hell the theorem is. It's a pleasure to find a high percentage in the Russian management circles where people have studied that theorem in college. What's required for it? Well, yes, you do want to have an intelligent brain to start with, but also you want to have the education. You want to have critical thinking you want to have systems perspective. You want, because what you want is to think about what kind of states the system can take. You want people to buy into the reality that the world is not only nonlinear, it's highly nonlinear. The expectation that Luke talked about that you come to Russia and logic doesn't work. Well, some logic does work, but linear logic people re recognize may be great for passing tests, but it simply is unhelpful in business. You're going to have infinitesimally small variations on unimportant parameters, which could bite you very hard, not too far into the future. And the recognition that you cannot find scientific explanations for a lot of these things is again, part of the DNA, part of the experience. It has been that way for centuries. Um, so a response to complexity in the system needs to come with greater variety of the brain. Russians have it. Russians have, again, not all Russians, not all management cadre, but significantly higher percentage than you would find in global management managerial population. People also often go into management from STEMI subjects. Uh, there are a lot of mathematicians. There are a lot of people who've studied physics. The idea for them that you can quickly create a model and not buy into what the computer run tells you at the end of running that model, 
but use the model to learn and understand the system, which is all most models are good for. Again, you'll find that in Russia, people are much more accepting of that and much more ready to embrace it. Lastly, so we have the mindset, we have the um, skill stack. Lastly, there are behaviors. In great levels of volatility, great levels of uncertainty with ambiguity, you want to respond with agility. You want to respond with experimentation. You want to respond with action. And in my experience, just working with CBSD, you can present some idea and there would be Anna and Igor and several other people that we get together with and boom, we decided, let's try it out. You see that with a lot of the clients as well. Once they understand that you truly do mean them well, and once they understand that you may not have the luxury of wait, waiting for decades for scientific proof of a hypothesis, they're willing to buy into a conjecture and they're willing to commit to a conjecture for a few experimental cycles. They're able to leverage the high variety in their toolboxes with quick turnarounds and experimentation. So overall, again, not across all of Russia, not across all populations uh, clusters, but you will find a higher percentage of people ready to embrace what is critical and necessary. So that's why I enjoy working there. Not belittling the kind of issues that Luke brought up as challenging. Those challenges are real and the opportunities are real. Thank you, Alexander. Thank you, Alexander. That was a deep dive into the Russian soul, I guess, and brains. So uh, being a professor and consultant and engineer and doing a lot of uh, things in learning and education, uh, what do you think Russia is desperately needed for be part to, to get to get involved into the greater world in 21st centuries, to, to get all the advantages of the future which is there. I think that just look at, at the beginning, I said that I would not consider putting my operations center in Russia and hope to have equal results to doing that in Hong Kong. Um, I would consider having R&D centers, quick turnaround, things that require significant brain power with a low level of confidence. Those are great opportunities. And then there are exchanges. If we remember um, 10 years ago, maybe a little bit more, uh, you could see that the world viewed Brazilian leaders, managers or leaders coming from Brazil, as somebody quite desirable. In part because Brazilians have under, undergone the training with the basket case that Brazil has been, especially with unpredictable finance. These people have gone through so many iterations of how to adjust. They would make perfect quick decision makers for companies worldwide. You have a similar opportunity with Russia. There are peculiarities, peculiarities with the uh, challenges with the government, peculiarities with the educational system, peculiarity with the character, which create opportunities in some areas, and you have to search them out. But to search them out, you have to engage. Thank you, Alexander. Thank you. I want to, uh, well, I, I, would, I would appreciate this talking to get further, but we have just 15 minutes to the end. So I'll give a floor to Alex Dalinsky, Alexei. Uh, and this is a great start. Uh, like th this is the great question we've started uh, discussing with Alexander. 
And uh, Alex, being a professional in a uh, marketplace for educational technology and education uh, in a broader meaning, uh, what do you think is needed to get Russia involved in the net of mm -hmm. education, to get to be part of the educational system, to give its brain power to the world and get the knowledge and the, everything technology from the world. So give us a little bit overview of what you are researching and what do you think of the Russian? Thank you, so, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. It's a great pleasure to congratulate uh, Thunderbird on 75th uh, birthday. So that's um, great achievement and uh, honor to be here and to speak here. Um, I will start by building on what um, Alexander and, and Luke said. Most importantly, focusing on these uh, layers, uh, onions paradigm. Um, I was thinking that, um, well, indeed, Russians have many layers, and um, it's important to understand that Russia is a huge country. So you need to find the right spots to interact with. You need to find the right people to work with. It's not like you approach um, anybody in the streets of New York and you can speak the same language. Not like that in Moscow. You probably won't be able to speak English uh, to anyone you find on the streets. So, you need, first of all, you need to find somebody who speaks English. Where do you find these people? So, to understand Russia, we need to understand part of Russian history, especially in the 20th and the 21st century. One thing that people don't, uh, well, often forget about Russia is that Russians is one of the largest uh, separated nations. There are millions and millions of Russians living outside of Russia. In fact, Russia is number three in, in that domain. I think it follows only India and Mexico, and uh, actually it's ahead of China. And um, what, what does that mean for, for Russians in Russia? That means that there is a huge community of global Russians who stay in touch with Russian Russians. And a large part of this global community actually work in the largest IT country, uh, companies of the world. I mean, um, Alphabet is the most obvious example, but there are other unicorns founded by Russians in the Silicon Valley and elsewhere. And um, there is a huge connection between these guys and the IT community in the former Soviet Union. There is effectively a global network of uh, people with STEM background, like Alexander just said, who succeeded in all kinds of uh, companies worldwide and who do the same in Russia. Right now, there is a growing uh, cohort of future global champions in uh, information technology that's growing in the former Soviet Union. We know some of the companies that are NASDAQ traded, that are mostly focused on the Russian speaking market. Uh, those uh, billion dollar companies, we all know them, we can see how their stock is doing, etc. It's growing. But there is a larger community of smaller companies that are suppliers to global IT companies that we know, that are suppliers to Googles and Amazons. And those companies, those we don't know yet, but they exist. And they are the best people to work with because they have the competency, they have the technology, they know how to work on the global level. I'd focus on this part of Russia. Then there is another community you might be looking at. Um, there is a group of companies that I call national champions that are mostly ex exporting companies. Again, um, they mostly work on the B2B community, so we don't look at them every day. We might not know their brand names, but at the same time, the efficiency, the uh, return rates, the ROI is comparable or way higher than you see in most Western markets. So looking into those companies, seeing their opportunities, trying to cooperate with them, offering services to them, is something that uh, you might explore. That's that's what I've been doing myself. Uh, I'm a founder of a US based company, but I work uh, a lot with Russian companies. And I noticed that they are really close in terms of what they're looking uh, in their development needs. So the best companies in Russia and the best companies worldwide, they actually are very alike. Um, I was going to show my slides. Uh, how can I do that? Okay. Oops. Uh, how to... Do I have to share my screen or how does... Okay. Yeah, the slides are there. You have to use the control buttons. Right, okay, got it, thanks a lot. So and that's some uh, some research we uh, did at Cosalytics, uh, well, in the beginning of this year. Those are the topics of new courses launched at uh, 
about 70, 80 uh, top business schools worldwide. So in 2020, a lot of new courses were launched on leadership and change management. Uh, this year, we mostly see new courses uh, on change management and leadership. So change management is number one these days. And uh, that's exactly what we see in Russian companies. That's what we talk with, uh, with Russian CEOs and HRDs and business owners. They focus on the same thing. And interestingly, um, there is uh, another thing that they changed in the world of business education. Uh, that is similar in Russia and the rest of the world. So there are a bunch of topics that raised uh, way higher than they used to be in the past. And most importantly, those are leadership in the domain of self-management, uh, resilience, mindfulness. Effectively, uh, in 2020, everybody learned how to manage themselves and remain efficient and be able to help others. These days, companies in Russia, and that's the same we see worldwide, seem to be focusing on long-term development, and that's why the topics of uh, uh, diversity, environmental, social governance, uh, and similar issues that effectively focus on long-term development raised to the top of the agenda, and that's again similar in the rest of the world and Russia. So my point being here with Russia having so many layers and being so diverse, it's important to find the right partners, and like Luke said, you need to go beyond Kremlin. You might want to avoid the government's uh, supported organizations. But other than that, there are millions and millions of super talented people who compete globally and who can learn from you and who can be your great partners. So that's, that would be my question to your question, Igor. That would be my answer. Question to the question is so Russian. That's true. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Okay, uh, so Igor, may I? Yeah, uh, there's a question in the uh, from the the audience from Bernd, who says, based on your experience, and this could be for Alex or any of the panelists, based on your experience, what are the most interesting and productive industries and sectors for a for a purchasing perspective? Alex, do you have some thoughts or? Uh, yeah, you... yeah, yeah, definitely. So, uh, well all kinds of IT companies focusing on the global market. Uh, essentially any service that's uh, built by Russian engineers and sold globally, that could work because uh, that's, that's number one. Number two, uh, biotech, that's booming in Russia right now. Uh, to a certain extent because of the regulation differences, but mostly because of what Alexander said, that's uh, just a great number of people with uh, excellent background in STEM. And, um, and ad tech. I see a lot of learning interest in Russia these days. This sector is uh, is growing everywhere, but in Russia it seems to be growing a bit faster. So that, that would be my preference. I don't know what the rest of the guys would say. Alexander, Luke, a couple of words from your part. Yeah, um, just to add to that, um, I mean, the government's policy has been to keep the ruble quite weak. Uh, which means that Russian companies can now export. One of the big areas we've seen uh, production recently is agriculture, that previously, uh, you know, the quality of food that was being produced was actually quite low. If you wanted anything decent, it had to be imported. And a lot of Russian producers of, uh, let's say, you know, food and drink ingredients are actually saying, look, please keep the sanctions in place. Because obviously when Russia came back with the counter sanctions, it you know, meant that it gave a real boost to local producers uh, and gave them a much bigger share of the market. And we're now finding that many of them are beginning to export their products. And also some light engineering manufacturing uh, with a weaker ruble, it means that it's now profitable to export. So, uh, you know, there's still a long way to go. But we've seen that. So particularly, uh, yeah, agriculture is probably one of the biggest ones we're seeing. Thank you, Luke. Okay, to get to the ending of this session, uh, well, I see a true Thunderbird audience here. We have a Brit Canadian living and working in Russia for more than 20 years. We have some Russians uh, being Americans as well and working in America and Europe at the same time. So it's a, it's a true international audience, a true international speakers. 
And what I like, the, the, the borders frequented by trade seldom need soldiers, quote, uh, is quite applicable here. And what I, what I heard from all of you is the, uh, the answer to the question, why Russia is, so, is, is the place to do business uh, in or with. Uh, market has a great potential. Uh, brain power is so strong and the culture, the people are open-minded and are brave and innovative. So you want, it, you want to engage them in all kinds of business opportunities. So the last questions, the, the last question I want you three answer like shortly is how to succeed with the modern Russia in the 21st century. What would be uh, your advice? I'll, I'll start with this one. Um, look, ignore the stereotypes. Come here and be prepared for the long term. Come with an open mind. Don't just assume you can make a fast buck here. Most importantly, talk to people who have done it already, both Russians and foreigners, not just the ones working for a multinational, but the expats who've been here for 20 years, so they can tell you, uh, you know, what you should do, what you shouldn't do, what to be aware of. Engage with chambers of commerce like the AmCham uh, that can be invaluable. So get the advice before wading in, uh, but seriously, look past all the propaganda. Thank you, Luke. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll speak next. Um, I don't remember, Igor, if you remember, but um, you once invited me to run a session for one of our clients in Russia on the topic of how to do business in India. And having lived in India for a number of years, um, I felt qualified enough to explain how to do business in India to the Russian audience. And one of the things that Russians are very proud of is the idea that, um, from one of the Russian writers, in a bad translation, it basically says that you can't comprehend Russia, you cannot embrace Russia with your mind. You, you can't understand Russia with your mind. And while it, um, everybody nods to that and feels uh, self-congratulatory congratulatory about how complex and uh, unique Russia is. Uh, when you think about a country like India, you certainly cannot understand India with your mind either. In fact, most countries you can't really understand with your mind. <laughs> and one of the things that may be required, as it was the case for doing business in India, um, you need to have what I would call a journalist mindset, where if you send a business leader to do business in country XYZ, it might take them years to figure out what, what's what. But if a good newspaper sends an experienced journalist to XYZ where they haven't been, after about a week, they're able to know who to listen to and what the leading drivers are. Beyond that mindset, I think that what is very helpful is having a few trusted advisors. Just like in India, people who lived and grew up there smell the intent behind a smile or behind a commitment, behind a handshake. It is very similar in Russia. People who understand, understand. The one thing, however, I would um, kind of etch in stone in Russia, there's no naivete. There are no naive Russians. And you need to remember that. So, given that, get an advisor and try it out. Alex. I totally agree with what's been said. Uh, I mean, uh, yes, you need to find trusted advisors, people who worked with Russia in the past, etc., etc. People. Um, Number two, yes, I totally agree with Alexander. You need to stay foolish. You need to stay open-minded. You need to explore. And when you do that with an open mind, you'll get results fast. And uh, the last thing I think uh, I'll quote one of the uh, one of US ambassadors in Russia who whom I asked a few years ago uh, about outcomes of a uh, high-level uh, international summit that took place in the country and all kinds of world leaders attended. So I asked this ambassador who was there. So a lot of media reported things didn't go right, and what's your takeaway? 
I loved it. It was amazing. Wow, what did you like about it? Well, it was all going wrong, etc. That then he told me the most important thing about working in Russia. The key to success is low expectations. This way you are prepared for everything, you know. You you don't expect palaces, you don't expect being met with a uh, red carpets, you don't expect things uh, go always uh, according to the law. But you know, be prepared to be unprepared, be open minded and it's gonna be fine. Thank you. Thank you. This is so true. This is so Thunderbird. This is so global mindset uh, <laughs> way of thinking. Okay, Sanjeev. Oh, thank you, Igor. What a wonderful moderation. What a wonderful panel. Alex, Alexander, uh, Luke, thank you for sharing your wisdom and your expertise. We know that T-Birds around the world are listening in and, and are, are learning a lot. Uh, you know, we're just so proud of CBSD. I want to end where I started. CBSD is a shining light uh, in Russia for us as Thunderbird and the world. So thank you, Igor and Anna and everybody over there. Uh, we're going to get 5 million. You said maybe 50 million going forward. So yeah. let's keep it. Sure. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Stay safe and healthy. Thanks again, Igor. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you. Congratulations with the 75th anniversary. Congratulations to all of us. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thank you.